Okay, great. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, well, it's really wonderful to see everyone tonight. Um, thank you for being here. Um, Vince mentioned I'm on the board of um, Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And I saw that someone put in the chat that they're visiting from Ashland today. So hello and welcome from Ashland. Oh, hi, Jerry. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> so um, yeah, well, hopefully I'll get the chance to meet you in person at some point up in Ashland or, or down here in San Francisco. Anyway, um, welcome everybody tonight. It's um, really great um, to see you here. Uh, many of you I see on a regular basis at camera work. So I won't, I won't talk much about camera work tonight other than to say that I'm really proud to um, be partnering uh, with EPCO um, in this conversation tonight. The real star of the show this evening is Ms. Judy Dater and really excited um, to have her um, here tonight and to um, listen to her and to learn from her. It's a real honor and a real treat. So when Vince asked me if I would be in conversation with Judy, I was really thrilled um, to say yes to this. And um, we spent some time talking and getting to know each other a little bit. Um, so um, tonight, um, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction, um, but she will be showing you some work, um, which I think is exciting. So we'll be in conversation, but she'll be showing you some work. So some new work and some older work, some of which you might be familiar with and walking you through some slides. So I, again, I think you're in a, for a real treat tonight. And, you know, Judy is so modest. I asked her, you know, what is the occasion of um, you know, tonight's event? And she said, there's no occasion. Um, you know, just Vince asked me if I would give, I would give a talk um, to the group, the East Bay Photo Collective, and, um, and I wanted to do it. So I said, yes. Um, I also noticed that um, Judy also um, gave a little bit of an intro and a talk for, um, first exposures last week as well. So Judy is a real, uh, really a leading figure um, in the Bay Area uh, photography scene um, and really giving back to community, which I think is really wonderful. So Judy is so modest, even um, her resume is quite modest on, on her website, but I'll tell you a little bit about her. So she was born in Hollywood um, and she grew up in Los Angeles and her father owned a movie theater. Um, so that's one of the ways in which she came to understand the world and really had an influence on her photography, um, was thinking about movies. And in the early 60s, she attended UCLA and majored in art. And right after that, she moved to San Francisco and finished up at San Francisco State where she majored in photography. She is known as um, really an important figure in the West Coast School of Photography. Um, those people include Ansel Adams, Edward Weston, Brett Weston, Wynne Bullock and Imogene Cunningham. And um, many of those people took an interest in her work and really mentored her and encouraged her to pursue photography. And Imogene uh, Cunningham in particular had a real influence on her work. And maybe Judy will talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, her career has involved teaching, creating books, traveling, conducting workshops, making prints, videos, and um, continues to photograph. And we're really, um, Honored to have Judy here tonight with us. So again, please welcome me, uh, or please join me in welcoming Judy tonight. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, go um, yeah, go ahead. No, I just say I'm glad you're there. I'm glad I'm sitting here looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at me. What happened? <laughs> yeah, I have to keep adjusting my my screen. Um, so I'm looking at all the wonderful people out there. So it's nice to see everyone. Um, we're going to start off with a few questions, um, just kind of a Q&A with Judy, and then we'll move into um, looking at some photographs with her. Um, then we'll go back to some Q&A, um, or I have some questions, I should say, and at the end, um, we will take questions from the audience. If you do have questions, um, please enter them into the chat, and Vince will be monitoring the chat. So first question for Judy is, um, first things first, what drew you to photography? Well, I think, um, I think because my dad was an amateur photographer and um, he, was, he was an amateur photographer and he also was an amateur filmmaker. And it all kind of goes together with him owning a movie theater. Um, and just a few minutes ago when I got up and disappeared, um, I found this, <laughs> which was my first camera. And, um, I have it here in my studio. I'm talking to you from my studio in Berkeley. And um, anyway, I was, I was um, you know, just a little kid and I used to like to watch my father take the pictures and make the movies. And I always wanted to have him let me 
use the camera. I was always asking him, you know, can I take a picture too? I want to take a picture. So um, they bought me that little camera. And um, I think, you know, that was, that was really how I, how I got started. But I was also interested in art and um, not that photography is an art, um, but, you know, I thought, I thought I wanted to be an artist. And um, to me at that time, it meant being a painter or maybe a sculptor. And uh, I was always drawing and I was always painting and I take an art classes since I was a kid. And, um, and the photography was just kind of all wrapped up in that kind of together as part of um, my interest in photography. And it, it came from the fact that I like to make things. So I think, I think that's what, where, that, where that came from. Where it came from. And then how did you know that you wanted to be a photographer on a full-time professional basis? And, and how did you know that you were actually a photographer, that you actually made it uh -huh. as a photographer? Well, uh, the first question, the first part of that is easier. Um, I, I think I knew I wanted to be a photographer after I took my first photography class. And I had been an art major in college. And I went to UCLA first for three years and I majored in art and I did painting and drawing and sculpture and jewelry design and, you know, just everything that you had to do as an art major in, in school. And then uh, when I was a senior, I transferred up to San Francisco State. And um, as part of the art major program, you had to either take printmaking or photography. And I had always been kind of interested in photography, as I said. So I, I got myself into the photography class, um, kind of sneaky because at the time, I, the classes were really hard to get into. And I was working um, in the registration, you know, as a student, a student help thing. And uh, I basically just took one of those cards, one of the <laughs> cards for the photography class and put myself in it which was kind of illegal, but I did it. And that's how I managed to get myself into photography class. And um, I think the first time I saw something come up in the developer is when I decided I wanted to be a photographer. And it was no doubt um, a photogram, you know, and there was just something so magical and exciting about seeing something develop you know, you put a blank piece of paper and some wet stuff, and then the next thing you know, there's a picture. And I just found that to be incredibly exciting and magical. And I think that was when I, I just knew right away um, I wanted to do photography. And, and then of course, once I started taking pictures with a camera, um, I realized that um, it was probably the best medium for me to be able to, um, express, you know, how I felt about the world um, easier than painting or drawing. And um, I could tell stories with, with photography, through photography. And um, th that, I think the, the images and the, and the storytelling all came from my being brought up in a movie theater and watching pictures um, and stories on the big screen. And um, I, it, just, it just makes so much sense to me that that's where it came from. You know, since I was probably three years old, old enough to sit up in the movie theater and start watching big old black and white pictures up on the screen. So it just translated into photography. And um, actually, as part of the photography major um, at, at State, um, you also have to do some filmmaking. And I did a little filmmaking um, at, as a student and I liked it um, and it was exciting. And I kind of contemplated, Mel, maybe I should be a filmmaker or do films. And, and then I rejected it because um, I realized that making films uh, it was terribly expensive. And you also had to work with um, a crew or other people usually. And I just thought, I, I didn't think I was up to the job, 
you know, I thought I'm better off working on my own and just, just stick with photography. So I did, but I've always thought that if I had another life to live, I'd be a filmmaker. And now I'm fiddling around with video because video is something you can do um, more on your own and it's way less expensive than film. So, um, you know, I've done some video with some help from some people and um, have a video in my head right now that I'm going to tell you about. Okay. Well, <laughs> maybe we can persuade you to tell us about that in a little bit. Let me ask you if you don't mind. You talked a little bit about um, yeah, the relationship to photographs and movies. And I'm, I'm curious, does that mean that it, it sounds like, I'm, I know that you've worked hard, right? So it's not just you know natural talent. You know, there are so many things that you also had to learn to become a photographer. But I'm curious about editing and sequencing and the types of things that um, you know, one does um, in photography that are related to that, you know, kind of share, um, share process with movies. And I wonder if, that comes somewhat easily to you um, in terms of editing and sequencing your work and, and things like that. Do you have thoughts about that? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, editing, of course, a big part of photography is editing. And, uh, you know, we all take a lot of photographs, tons of them. And the way I feel about it, especially if I'm doing a portrait of somebody, um, if I take two dozen portraits, and I'm talking about using a four by five camera and spending an hour or two with the person, um, I'm only trying to get one good picture. I'm lucky if I get one out of all those, all those shots and, and that time. So picking the right one, I think is really, really important. And um, I also believe that um, as a photographer, um, I have to make that choice, you know, that it, that, there have been a number of photographers recently um, that have been discovered after they're dead and there's nothing to go on and people um, find their work and they're doing the editing. And I find that that's uh, a little weird. It's not, for, to me, it's not really expressing the work of, of that person. That person has to make, you have to make the decision as to which pictures you pick and which ones you're, showing to the world and uh, you know you have very specific reasons. So I do think that the editing process is really personal and really important. And uh, sequencing um, for me is really important um, because it, it helps reinforce the story. You know, you're, if, if you're doing a book, let's say, or, or an exhibition that every picture you put up, um, what you put next to it, you know, they talk to each other and they bounce off each other and they have to look good together. Um, if you have two pictures on a page in a book, you know, they can't just be random. They have to, there has to be some relationship to what's going on. And then that you turn the page and then there's another thing and, it, you know, it, it, it builds up on in a certain way to tell, to help you tell your story. So I do find that that's, quite important. It's, it's just part of the process. Yeah, okay. Um, and let me ask you, what keeps you photographing? I'm curious about that. So we talked about, you know, kind of what drew you to photography. That might not be the same reason that you stay photographing. You might have to find new inspiration. So curious about what keeps you photographing. Um, well, it's what I know how to do, for one thing. <laughs> and um, I just, I like taking pictures um, there. And I like taking pictures um, in different ways. Like when I'm, one way of working is when I'm working in my studio with my four by five and I'm shooting film, black and white film. And, um, and then I get the film developed and then I scan it now because I'm not working in the dark room anymore. And then I make prints from that, but I'm still shooting film. Um, and when I can't do that, and I, there have been periods of time when, like the COVID business, uh, I didn't feel very comfortable having people come over into my studio to, to do portraits. So I just haven't done any black and white portraits for a really long time. Um, 
So I shot, started using things with my cell phone just because I have felt like I had to keep uh, keep doing something, keep talking in a way, you know. Um, so um, anyway, that's um, it, it's just some innate need to communicate, I think. Um, and if I can't do it one way, I'm, I do it another way. And lately, I've been writing, which is weird. I always thought um, I couldn't write and I didn't like to write. And um, uh, in fact, the reason I, one of the reasons I liked photography in the beginning was that I felt like I could tell stories and say things through my pictures without having to open my mouth and not, that I wouldn't have to talk and I wouldn't have to explain anything. And I didn't want to explain anything. Um, and photography seemed like a really good means of expression without having to use words or talk. Now I like, now I kind of like words more. <laughs> so I've started using words in my work. Um, and I mean, I always have actually, not always, but at, at a certain point I started to. And now I'm, I'm, I'm kind of more interested in that. Um, but I like, I like pictures, I, you know, I like to make pictures. If I didn't have a camera, I think I'd draw on the back of an envelope. You know, I mean, it's just some need to make pictures one way or another. I think it's interesting you talk about um, the desire to express without having to explain yourself. And um, I thought it's interesting, you know, a photograph as a declarative statement. Um, a photograph could also be a question or a provocation. I'm curious if you, you know, I don't know if you have thoughts about that in terms of, um, I mean, I really like what you're saying there about, you know, taking a photograph, but not really having to explain it and letting it speak for itself. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I have an idea about what it means or what I think I want to express or, or at the very least, how the picture makes me feel. And, um, and I, I want to, I want the photograph to um, evoke not necessarily the feelings that I have about it, but that if somebody's looking at it, they get some feeling out of it, you know, that they make their own story up and that um, there's enough things going on in the picture that maybe they can, they can relate to it some way or another. Because I think everybody, you know, you bring stuff to, you bring some of yourself to looking at art, you know, and, and each person is an individual and has their own individual experiences and feelings and whatever. And um, I'm providing some kind of a framework and somebody else will come in and maybe fill in their own details. Um, and lots of times people see the same thing or get the same thing out of it, but you know, I don't, I don't care if they, <laughs> it doesn't have to be whatever I'm feeling. It, it's just feel something for God's sake, you know? Um, so that's kind of how I, how I feel about it. Yeah, but you're leaving room for people. You're leaving room for people to feel something, to relate to it in the way that they would like to, not necessarily kind of what you intended necessarily. Right. I, I mean, think, I think, you know, yeah. even if it's on a kind of a subliminal level, um, that it tweaks something. Yeah. And, and Richard says in the chat, he says he loves this. He says, I love to hear this. There's such a pressure to write a story to accompany one's work these days. So he likes that, you know, just the, the photograph, the statement. Although I think you've been doing some, some writing lately along with your work. So. I have, I have, yes. But no uh, pressure, it sounds like. Do you wanna, would you like to talk about um, what you've been up to lately? And we have some slides to share. Maybe let me know when you, when we should start sharing slides. And um, if you wanna um, kind of give an intro to what you've been working on and how you've been thinking lately. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it's time to look at some pictures. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, two of the bodies of work that I put together tonight um, are things I've never shown before. This is, they're coming out party right now, right now. And- um, Good luck, it's exciting. Um, this is really wonderful, it's a real treat. Well, it's scary too, but you know, eventually one does have to do that. So <laughs> this is the moment. And um, I think I, I mentioned to you, I'm going backwards. So I'm, I'm gonna show the most recent project that I started 
um, working on that I'll uh, give a little history about it. Um, actually, this is it. This is, this is the project right here. See that? This is my journal that I kept. This is my COVID journal right here. And um, I, I started it in March of 2020, right after the lockdown or, you know, right at that moment in time. Um, and I hadn't really done any photography for six or seven or eight months. I don't even know how long it was. I hadn't done much of anything because I was sick. And so um, the first thing that I did after, no, I, have, I wasn't through with everything yet, but uh, I, I just felt like I had to do something in regard to this plague that we were all, it descended on us, everybody. So um, I, 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 didn't, I didn't think I could do anything with my four by five, but I felt some need to do something with what was happening in the world. And I started taking pictures with my cell phone um, and making little prints and sticking them in that journal and then scribbling some notation either. Sometimes I didn't write anything. Sometimes it was just the date and the day of the week or whatever. Um, and I decided when I started the project, I wanted to work on it. I said, well, I'm gonna do it from March 15th. I can't remember what the first day is, whatever it was. March 15th, let's say of 2020 to March 15th of to 2021. I'm gonna do it for exactly a year. And um, so I just started in doing that. And um, it's really, an, it's interesting for me to go back and look at it now. Now that 2020 seems like a hundred years ago in a funny way. Um, and when I see all the things that happened that year, um, I, I, I love it as a kind of a document of, of that year. Um, so I, I, I just, picked out um, to show to show everybody tonight one photograph um, for each month starting in March and going through December. And this was the very first photograph in the first page of the of the journal. Um, and it's the cover of the book. And it says, and then came the plague. And that was the start of, of this journal. And what is the date? March 16th, 2020. So the next one is, you can go to the next one, um, was April. And of course, there's a lot of stuff in between. And, um, and I, I wasn't making this journal really as art, as like some art project thing it was really making it for myself um so there's you know a lot of pretty mundane stuff in it um but this this particular page is significant for me because it was april 13th which was the last day of um radiation therapy and a friend of mine brought over this great bottle of champagne so that was that's a page I just picked out for April. So you can go to April, May is next. And as I say, you know, lots of stuff happened in between. And I kind of went from being sick into COVID and finishing, <laughs> finishing up the treatment and coming out the other side. So May, it seemed to me that the big, big thing that happened in May was uh, the Black Lives matter and this was a i don't know how big people are seeing these pictures on your screen but um this was on fourth street in berkeley uh that was completely boarded up um and uh you know plastered with posters and it was it was a very um tense moment as you all know 
Okay. And then there's June. And by June, you know, we're all getting pretty sick of this business and there's not much to do or no place to go. Um, and I'm sitting there watching Rachel Maddow every night and drinking my martinis. And um, this one is, uh, this is my recipe for getting through the nightly news. And um, there's my wonderful dog. And oh, this is where I should tell you what my thought about my video. So I have this journal with all these pictures in it. And I'm thinking I might wanna make a video out of it and that the dialogue, which won't be reading these quote, these things from the book, I'm, I'm writing a whole nother script about it, would be my dog talking about going through everything with us. So he would be the narrator. And there's more pictures of him in the journal than anything. So he, he's a prominent uh, character here. I don't know if you can see Judy, but people are smiling and laughing at that. I am have gone off camera just so I don't chew up, um, you know, too much um, bandwidth. So I, I don't um, stop the screen sharing, but I'm still so, here listening. I see your sweet face. Um, <laughs> okay, so now this is one of the, you know, pretty mundane picture, but I went to visit a friend of mine who's, well, at the time she was 92. And uh, she was just about to turn 92 and she has a gorgeous garden in San Francisco. Her name is Minette and I love her. And we've been friends for 48 years, 49 years now. Anyway, that's, you know, there's a lot of just funny mundane stuff um, wrapped into this, mixed in with a lot of intense stuff. Okay, we can go to August. And, you know, I think this one is just represents, you know, utter boredom and contemplation, just spending an awful lot of time sitting on the couch, being in the house, staring at my feet. That I kind of like this photograph. Okay. And this was September. Then we had that incredible um, fire many, many fires last year. That was another, you know, horrible part of 2020. I'm afraid we're not through with it. And um, this was the view from uh, the Berkeley Marina towards San Francisco at 9.15 in the morning. And uh, it was, uh, I think this one says apocalyptic, uh, 9.15 a.m smoke from the wildfires has turned our world red. It's, it's like being on another planet. The world has gone mad. I think that's what it says. <coughs> anyway, it was amazing. It was an amazing thing to see that day. Okay. I think we all remember this one. <laughs> oh, this is one of my favorites. I mean, I have a ton of political stuff from the television, but um, this was really great. Uh, the look on his face, <coughs> smug, wary. Uh, oh, I can't read it. <laughs> but the fly stole the show. And Kamala remains calm and strong. <laughs> that was an amazing moment. Yeah, I think it's a smug, wary, condescending. Condescending. But the fly sold the show, which is true. That is true. It really did. It was mind boggling, actually. <laughs> it was just amazing. And you know, I have lots of stuff during from the election and onward and and I I continued to take photographs, you know, into January and February. I mean, I still am taking pictures, but I ended up, I ended up wrapping this thing up in December. But okay, we can go to November. And that was Thanksgiving. 
but we had outdoors with my husband and his son and girlfriend. And there's Blakey under the table waiting for something to drop. And uh, we'll just talk about what we had to eat. We were being very good by eating outside. And we did the same thing for Christmas Eve. Luckily, it was warm enough, but it just reminded me of, you know, how we all had to socialize outdoors. And now that we've been fully vaccinated and we can be together with our friends indoors now. It just feels fantastic. So if you haven't gotten it yet, please go get it. We have to, I have to say it was, it was really great to feel like you can start getting back to normal life again. Okay. Okay, so this is the last page in the book. When I got about seven or eight pages from the end of filling up that journal, I, I started really um, talking about editing. I really started um, wanting the, the last part of the journal to, uh, to, wind, to, to wind itself down on December 31st. And um, I like this picture so much that I decided to end the project with this picture, even though I continued to take pictures. But I retroactively decided I'd end it here because the picture looked so kind of uh, positive and hopeful. And this was another picture from, I took from uh, Cesar Chavez Park down at the Berkeley Marina. And it felt like um, half of Berkeley was down there that night. It was a really warm December day and evening. And it was a mind bogglingly gorgeous, spectacular sunset. And went up to the top of the hill. And I had the feeling that when the sun actually went down and sunk behind down under the horizon that everybody was gonna cheer because the year was over and it was like such a shitty year. Well, they didn't, everybody was very quiet, but um, this little picture um, seemed very hopeful to me because there's kids running and playing and people were playing instruments and walking and, and it was just so beautiful that I thought, well, let's, let's um, end this this horrible year with something positive. So that was, that was kind of how I wrapped it up. And of course, as you can see, there's a lot of other things in between, but that gives you an overview. And now that I have it, and I've started writing a kind of a script for my doggy to narrate, um, <laughs> uh, you know, that's probably the next thing I'm gonna try to work on a little bit. So that's my most recent thing. And uh, don't ask me what I'm going to do next. Oh, sorry, I said, don't ask me what I'm going to do next, because I have no idea. <laughs> but um, though I do have a, I do, I do want to go back to the project that I'm going to show you next, because I never felt like I really quite finished it, and I already think I have, I have somebody lined up to photograph. If I can never have people over here again, but okay. So, do you want to? Yeah. Do you want to go back to yourself and ask me anything about this before we go to the next bunch of pictures? Or yeah, let me do that actually. Okay, so I have a feeling that there are some questions here in the chat related. What do people say? Okay, people said, wow, that truly was a year. I was also photographing at the Berkeley Marina at 9.15 that morning. That's Kelly Sullivan who says that. Um, the moment about <laughs> oh the, the 9 15 morning that was the orange day the the red the red day not december 31st so that was the day that the sky turned um orange and, and blood red and then yeah people were reminded about the fly and what's this question love this albany bulb looks like it is that the is that a restaurant in albany no Kendra? it's a place it's it's a place, but no, that was not the Albany Bulb. That was the Berkeley Marina. 
uh, she's, that was Cesar Chavez Park, that picture at the gotcha. end. Yeah, actually, I guess I had a technical question for you um, on the on the on the book, and I'm interested in um, the photographs and how you printed them. Um, did you just kind of have like a like a printer at home from your iPhone and you just kind of um, printed those out and glued them into the book? Yep, that's what I did. I just set my, I set I set myself the pictures on to my, um, you know my my email <laughs> and, I let, and I took them off that and then um, fiddled with them and printed them out little little tiny pictures I find it really inspirational because it's not precious the photographs are really beautiful especially that last photograph I, I think and you know in my mind um you know all the, the joyousness especially the children playing and how they're silhouetted against the sky that has so many different colors and represents so much possibility um but they're not precious um, it doesn't feel like, um, you know, where you spend a lot of time, you know, trying to tweak the photos to print them, that kind of thing. Um, well, maybe, they're, yeah. they're not, but it's just like I was making a family album, you know, in the tradition of making a family album. So, you know, I made them, you know, as good as I could make them without spending too much time, you know, the little cell phone yeah. picture. That feels inspirational. And then I have a question. I hope it's not too personal. Who can decline to answer this? I just, it's interesting. You came out of your own treatment um, for chemotherapy, um, you know, full of life and excitement and then right into COVID um, and kind of into this, into this lockdown. And it's, it's just interesting to kind of have come out of something and be celebrating, you know, on a personal level and then, you know, have this, you know, worldwide pandemic tragedy. And I'm just curious how that if that influenced you, how it influenced you. If, but you don't have to talk about that. It's just something I, I noticed though. Well, it was mighty interesting. That's all I can tell you. Cause I yeah. was really looking forward to having the treatment over and getting, all I wanted was to get back to normal. All I, the normalcy was the only thing I was craving. And then there was no normalcy. Yeah. yeah. It was like, what? Wait a minute, you know, what the hell happened here? But, you know, everybody was in the same boat. There was absolutely nothing to do about it except go with it, you know? I mean, yeah. we were all in the same boat and it was shitty. And then there was all these other crappy things that happened that year. I mean, it was just endless. It was unbelievable. And, uh, but I was happy to be alive and, uh, you know, I knew it would be over eventually. I asked my doctor about it. I said, what about this pandemic? He says, oh, it's not as bad as the Spanish flu pandemic, you know. He says, oh, it'll be over. Don't worry. You know, it was like, that was sort of comforting, actually. We, um, uh, you know, but, you know, it was still horrible, as we all know, and it still is. Feels like it's getting better. But um, I don't know better to be alive than dead what can I say and I just you know you make the best of it you just make the best of it whatever the hell it is yeah and you decided to end it December 31st and move on to something new and different say that that's it goodbye I, to I, yeah I mean for a couple of months I kept taking pictures I mean uh, you know with the, that in mind like I have some great pictures of the inauguration and I have some great pictures from January 6th and you know I thought well that stuff is really amazing and you know it ought to be in here and I thought no it's all right it doesn't have to be in here and mm -hmm. uh, that's another thing and this this is what it is and now we can move on so fair enough well thank you for sharing that that new work with us which is amazing thank you every uh, thank you so much um Judy for sharing that work um and, at, you know, I know we'll have probably more questions at the end. Okay, you have more work that you want to show us that's new as well, right? Do you want to set that up? Yeah, I do. I do. I'll show you that. I'm seeing, I'm looking at the time and I'm thinking maybe, we, maybe we'll just show this work and then we can answer questions or something because it's already getting there, getting up, talking way more than I thought. <laughs> so let's, let's just talk about the next project. You can put up that first picture. Okay, give me a second. I will put it up. Mm. 
And this one, I've never shown this picture, this, this bunch of work. No, I haven't shown this e the book thing either. Okay. Um, all right, so this project is, I, I call it the gun next door. I started it around 20, in 2015. And um, the reason I started it was because I had been in New York and I saw um, a big ink drawing of a gun on the wall of um, the Zwerner Gallery in New York. And I was really taken with this drawing. And unfortunately, I can't tell you who did it. I haven't been able to find out. But um, the gun was so evocative and so powerful and just the way the artist had drawn it, it made me really think about wanting to use, wanting to do something about photographing guns or something about guns um, because of the intense symbolism and you know what they mean and what they stand for. I just, I just sort of, was very provocative to me. And also there had been at that time, another mass shooting, you know, endless, this endless mass shootings. And I wanted to try to make some kind of a statement about that. And um, I had told Michelle the other day that I'm not political in terms of my work, at least not overtly, but this project, I've forgotten about it actually. <laughs> this one certainly, uh, the initial motivation was, and I think, you know, obviously it is a big political issue, the, the gun thing. So I went into it with one kind of an idea and I ended up doing something that I never would have imagined that I would have done and, uh, I don't know, it, it's, I'm, I'm trying to talk about this. I've never talked about it because I have never really put these pictures up. Um, but basically I learned a lot. Let's just say I learned a lot from talking to people that owned guns. And um, this particular one was the very first photograph that I took in the series. And the reason, it's one of my favorites actually. And the woman said she'd pose for me, but she wanted to remain anonymous. And so I just called this one anonymous. She didn't want to show her face. And um, I think it's a really evocative picture that, you know, you could look at it and you could think, well, a lot of things. She either is contemplating suicide or she just shot somebody or she's really unhappy or, I mean, you know, you could make up a lot of things about this photograph in term, I think. So um, I, I started with her and then I just started asking everybody I knew, do you know anybody that has a gun? And that's how I got all my subjects. And once I got some people, then those people also knew a lot of other people that owned guns. These are all Bay Area people. Um, and that would include going, you know, San Jose and Vallejo, but mostly uh, San Francisco, Berkeley, Oakland, you know, pretty much right around here. So um, a neighbor's across the street. Um, so anyway, um, I started showing these pictures to people and they really wanted to know, well, who is that and what's the story and whatever. And I hadn't intended to do it, but as the project went along, I started asking the people questions and I started distilling down their stories to one short page. And I had certain kinds of questions I was asking after, after I did a number of them, the questions became more the same. But this first one, I'll read you, you can go to the next one. The next one is the story. And I don't know, 
I'm looking at these on my iPad, so I think they're pretty hard to read off the iPad, but I'll read, I'll read it here. I have the text. Um, this is anonymous, age unknown from Berkeley, California. She, call, she calls herself an artist and a gym rat. She inherited this gun from her uncle and knows how to use it. Guns have come to symbolize, this is a quote from her. Guns have come to symbolize safety and freedom, but have one purpose, to kill or to harm. At least, uh, yet are less regulated than cigarettes. At least cigarettes afford some comfort, though I guess the same could be said for target practice. And words, this is her again, words that come to mind regarding guns, power, tyranny, war, and technology. And that, so that was one, that was the first one and the, and the first little story. So we can go to the second one. Okay. This is William Abernathy. Now, the way I got I got to photograph this particular person. I mean, because the connections are, are very, are very strange and, and random and interesting, I think. Um, I, I had a woman who's a bookbinder come to my studio and um, I was having her bind a cookbook of mine, my favorite old cookbook, the first one I ever got back in 1960 or something. And I had a few of these gun portraits up in my studio and she was really intrigued with them. And she told me that her husband had a gun. I said, oh, great. You think he might want to pose for me? And she said, well, I'll ask him. So anyway, he did. And, and then he told me, he, I, I loved his story. You can go to the story. Okay, so his story, his name is William Abernathy, 54 years old, from San Francisco, California. He's a technical writer. His parents were gun-hating urban liberals. He moved to Oregon for college and shortly after graduation bought his first rifle. He later acquired a revolver, but stopped carrying it when he left for New York. He says, I used to be a Second Amendment fundamentalist, someone you really did not want to be stuck talking with at a party. As I've grown up, I've become profoundly ambivalent about uh, firearm ownership and find guns charismatic and repellent in equal measure. I have the same attachment to them as you might have to old golf clubs or a leather jacket you never use anymore, but just can't bear to part with. They remind me of being younger. Um, I, I like that, what he had to say. Anyway, the variety of people that I came across was amazing. Okay, you can go to the next one. And this is um, Jessica Peters, who um, I met through my personal trainer, whose husband owned a bar. And this woman used to come into the bar all the time. And she, so I knew about her and I asked, I asked my trainer to ask her husband to ask this woman if she would want to be photographed. And she said she did. And apparently she even knew who I was. So she, she sent me a picture of herself and in the picture she was dressed like this. And so I said, well, when you come, could you please wear that outfit? And so she did. And I started thinking that people, a lot of the people um, would have these fantasies about themselves and their guns. And that it was kind of an, like an avatar of some sort. So I thought to me that, was, that became very interesting. So this is Jessica Peters, 39 years old from Oakland, California. She's a cannabis entrepreneur, CEO of her own company, Moxie Meds, formulated especially for women's needs. She's an avid vegan and animal lover. She identifies as queer. In a terrifying incident, she was once sexually assaulted. If someone attacks me again, they won't succeed. And if someone is going to end up dead, it won't be me. 
her firearm is a Glock bodyguard. Okay, go to the next one. So I'm trying to remember. I, I met this man. Um, I met this man through someone else I had photographed. I, was, I got I got plugged into a a gun community uh, in San Francisco called the Pink Pistols, and it's uh, a gay rights gun rights organization. And somebody told me about this person, and I. Um, corresponded with him and he didn't have a car. And I said, well, I'll pick you up at the BART station. And, and uh, I have a red VW when you come out of the BART station. But anyway, he came over and he had this backpack and that's how he carried his firearm over to Berkeley. Well, anyway, I just, I love the backpack, so. I had to have that included in the photograph. And his story is, his name is Tom Boyer. He's 58 years old from Kansas City, Missouri. He's a spokesperson and civil rights activist for the Pink Pistol San Francisco chapter, an LGBT gun rights group. Volunteers at the David Bonnet Cyber Center in San Francisco, helping the greater LGBT community, including many young people who need support because of bullying, harassment, and physical violence. He is HIV positive, has a passion for early music, sometimes transports his firearm in a Disney princess backpack. <coughs> and then there's a quote. I started asking people if they had favorite quotes and he didn't have one, but he has this at the end of all of his emails and it's was an infinite, Myths lies the eternal truth. Who sees it all? Varuna has but a thousand eyes. Indra has a hundred, you and I only two. By Div Dutt, Patonic, Patonic. Anyway, okay. That's just a sample of some of the stories. We can just, I'll show you just a few more of the portraits. Yeah, so Judy, just really quickly, can you explain this? This quote again, is this one of his favorites? Is he asked you to include this? It's 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 his favorite. I mean, I don't know if it's his favorite quote, but it's it's a quote that, you know, when people put things at the end of their emails sometimes. And yeah. this was and this was always at the end of his emails, that quote. And so when I did these, I asked people these questions and they or you know to say stuff and they did and then I would edit it down because it had to fit on one page and then I would send it to them so they could make sure it was okay and there was nothing in it they didn't want or like and once they okayed it then it was okay so I had I included this quote from his email and he seemed to think it was okay so I left it gotcha. but there are other people where I've asked them for you know specific quotes and they've told them and and they're they're at the bottom so that's where that quote is. I don't understand, but that's what it is. Yeah, I think it's interesting. That's what I was asking you. Huh? Right. Check it yeah, it is. It's intriguing. And then I'll just show you a few more of the people. This piece, this person was also um, from the Pink Pistols, a transgender person. And, okay. I can go ahead and this one, this one also, same thing. But this, this person had a really interesting story. Um, it was from China and um, this, I don't know if you can see the dress, it's got little pussy cats on it. Uh, she claims to have invented the, what they call the Lolita style of dress. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but that's what that's what she, one of the things she told me. For gun owners or for or just in general? No, it's like these little dresses for grown women. Um, you know, it's uh it's a fetish thing where they have these little 12 dresses that like little 12-year-old girls might wear, but 
but they're for adults. And it's called Lolita. Yeah. The Lolita. Lolita style. There seem to be a number of different cultures associated with the gun ownership. This is very interesting. Well, that's one of the things I discovered was that um, it's across the board, you know, I mean, at least here. And people, um, pe people, what am I trying to say? Well, the people that I photographed, they all had different relationships to their guns. Um, this particular person wouldn't sign a model release unless I swore that I would not make, do a negative um, thing in regard to, to guns, gun ownership. And I said, okay, I won't. And I, I don't think I have. And in a way, I guess I think, you know, it's like I didn't edit, I really didn't want to editorialize. I was trying to be, which is a hard thing to do, to, to not be judgmental and to not um, demonize anybody, um, which I don't like to do in my photography anyway. Um, and I just wanted to present what, what I was experiencing by photographing these people and the kinds of things um, that they were telling me. And a lot of the people were, um, even though they had guns of various uh, types, um, a lot of them were in favor of uh, gun, um, gun control. Not all of them, but, but I would say probably more more than, than we're not. I mean, I, I have to say myself, I'm 100% in favor of gun control. I never shot a gun in my life. I don't own a gun. Um, but I, I just found that um, it was, it's so complex that what it made me realize was that we, before jumping down somebody's throat, that, that there's a lot of, under, there's a lot of misunderstanding and that we need to just listen to people. I mean, I think that's true probably with everything, but um, but the gun thing is, man, it's a hot button issue. I've had people tell me I shouldn't be doing this um, because they think it's it's that I'm glorifying it somehow or I'm making it too positive. I don't think so. I just think I'm showing what it is that it's much bigger than <coughs> than any of us have the slightest idea, and that's why I call it the gun next door because there's a lot of closeted gun owners. And uh, I just think it's really, it's fascinating to me. So now I can't even remember what you asked me. <laughs> oh, I can't even remember the question either. I just, I think, <laughs> I just said there are a lot of facets to the people who own guns. A lot of what? There are a lot of facets to the people who own guns and there seem Absolutely. to be many different cultures associated with gun ownership. So it was just a statement. Um, oh, you know, right. you have some that looks like cosplay, you know, plus guns, um, which is interesting with, you know, different, you know, different outfits. Um, it's interesting. I mean, this is kind of an avatar. I mean, this, this whole outfit and, and the guns with the, this gun had these pink ribbons on it. And, um, and, you know, not every single person, but a lot of people, um, you know, identified, uh, had, had certain kind of fantasies. And it made me think about, you know, uh, all the movies, you know, that I saw as a kid, you know, the Westerns and the guns and, you know, kids with guns and, you know, this country has just grown up with guns. And uh, it's, just weird. <laughs> it's just a strange, interesting uh, phenomenon that that we are we're the only country I think that is as gun crazy as you know, as we are. Anyway, I think the next one might be the last one. I can't. I think the last. Sure. Thing. I think there's maybe two I more. Just but took a, yeah, I just I just made a, an overview. I've got around thirty five yeah. people. Oh and wow. I, all their stories and um, and they're all really different. And this man, 
this man worked in the bar of my friends, you know, my trainer's husband. He was the, he was the bouncer in the bar, but he was great. I mean, he had he came over with a couple of fabulous outfits, and um, he had one with a bowler hat. He really wanted me to use the one with the bowler hat, but it was too dark and it blended into the background. So I liked this one better. And I, and I loved that he finally showed me the tattoo on his arm, which says, we the people. And um, I thought that was pretty special. I, I really liked that. He had, he had been in the army and that's where he first learned to shoot guns or have anything to do with guns. And he, he was an interesting character. Are there more? I don't remember. Oh yeah, him. Oh yeah, he was. This great. is the last one. Okay. Um, yeah, he he's a big he's a big spokesperson for um, the gun rights community, and I got a lot of people through him. And um, he also um, models for gun magazines you know, in tactical gear and stuff. And, uh, oh, he, he told me stuff about his family. Um, his father attacked him when he was like 20 or something like that with a knife and sliced him all up. And I mean, it just such an intense story. Um, um, and he wanted to, um, He wanted to break the stereotype of Asian men as not being strong. So this was part of his sort of James Bond fantasy. I mean, I thought, you know, he came with the tuxedo and I felt like, you know, that again, another kind of an avatar thing. Um, and, uh, and he worked, he was a manager of a Verizon store. <laughs> That's what he, that was his work, but, um, you know, he, he introduced me to a lot of people. He was very helpful. And, uh, and uh, nice, nice person, but, you know, very, very uh, Second Amendment's rights advocate. So it was, a, it was an interesting, um, it, it was a really interesting, um, kind of trip that I went on while I was doing these photographs with these people. Have you stayed in touch with any of these people? Oh, I mean, is that your practice or not really? Um, it varies. It varies. Um, sometimes I stay in touch with people and sometimes I don't. Um, I have all of their addresses. I sent everybody pictures and I told them if it ever, if I ever have a show of these works or if I ever, you know, got a book or did anything with the pictures, you know, I'll invite them all. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I, I mean, a couple of them I actually know. There are a couple of people that I, that I personally know that have guns and of course I stay in touch with them, but, uh, you know, people go their way. So there's some questions, Judy, if you don't mind in the chat that people have, I can ask those to you about these photos in particular. Did you wanna, is that okay? Yeah, so you asking me, it's okay. Yeah, but I can ask you. Yeah, people have put some questions into the chat and some comments. So um, Ron Saunders says he can't stop looking. This is at the last photograph of the person's eye and the edge of the gun and the tip of his finger. Mm -hmm. um, and Kelly asks, Judy, did you pose them or did they choose a few of their own poses? You know, the body language is really strong. Um, I, no, um, with the gun pictures, I mean, usually I do pose people. I mean, I, you can't tell them, you know, do this and do that exactly. But people, when they come over here, you know, they sit down in a way and they might do something. And then I say, oh, that's really great. With these people with the guns though, I would ask them, you know, what, what might you do with that? Because I don't know what to do with a gun, you know? Um, and so that man in particular, he was very, um, 
he, cognizant. He knew exactly what to do with the gun. You know, he knew what, what real, you know, how to hold it and what to do with it. And he was used to being photographed in a magazine. Of course, usually, you know, when tactically here with a rifle and, you know, down like, you know, like that. But anyway, he, he, he knew what to do. And then I would say, okay, that's great. Hold it. You know, it's like sort of recognizing the moment that um, it looks it looks good. It looks right. Did you find yourself researching more about gun ownership or looking at images um, of Westerns or other kinds of um, images with guns or not necessarily? <laughs> uh, I did. I did do some of that. I started I started uh, archiving all kinds of articles about guns and gun ownership um, and uh, mass shootings. Um, you know, I have a, a lot of material that I saved in, in in regard to guns and guns in our society and the meaning of them. And um, yeah, I looked at some pictures of guns, gun owners, um, but mostly I, I mean, mostly I just would go with the flow and go with the person that came over and what they wanted to do or were willing to do. Um, and, um, you know, they had to, it's their, firearm and they have kind of had to feel comfortable with with doing it and most people know what you know if they have one they know how to hold it they know kind of what to do with it and one thing I must say about it was that in the beginning people would come over well they always did it but the, these people people I was photographing were very very conscious about gun safety and the first thing they would do I mean I would told I told them no, nobody can, you can't come over here with, with your gun loaded. It can't be loaded. And, um, you know, you have to show me. So, you know, first thing they would do is they'd come over and they usually had them in a locked case. They would open it up. They would show me that there was no bullets in there. And, um, and then we would take it from there. They all wanted me to pick up their guns, which I did. I'd never touched a gun in my life, but I, I did, I, you know, I held all their guns and, you know, they told me, you know, what to do, what not to do, how, where, you know, don't put your finger on the trigger, you do this. So I learned some stuff, but um, after about the 10th person, I realized that I was getting so kind of not worried anymore that I stopped asking them to show me that the gun wasn't loaded. And then I got scared. And I thought, no, you, you can't, you can't do that. So then I kind of backed up a little bit because I could see how you just, you get too lackadaisical about it or something, you know? So I, I didn't think that was so smart, but anyway, it was, uh, it was quite an education. Yeah, absolutely. Let me, let me ask this. Um, and maybe Vince can weigh in the audience as well, but Judy, um, you have a number of other photographs that you could show us. Um, and I know Vince, we're here until nine o'clock. Is that right? No, we're, we're not. Nine well, no, we, we have this space as long as we would like to use it. Uh, we certainly don't want to wear out anybody, especially Judy. Uh, but <laughs> uh, but I, I'm sure uh, we would love to see more images uh, if Judy agrees. Um, so Judy, well, let us know what you would like to do. We have well, questions or images. Yeah, go ahead. I did promise my husband I'd be home at 8.30 or that I would knock it off at 8.30. But I mean, if you want to look at pictures, I can show you the pictures. You want to flip through them? What does the audience say? Yes? Okay, people really want to see your pictures. Okay, so we'll, uh, let's flip back to those. And Should we go with the cow? Yeah, go ahead. You, you can always go look at them on my website too. <laughs> There's a lot of them on my website. <laughs> And you could look at my memoir video on my website. I, I highly suggest that if you want to laugh. But <clears throat> anyway, sure. Um, okay, well, I'm still going backwards from, you know, the newest to the, and, and I didn't go too far. Well, I did go too far back, but, and I, I left out a ton. But the next little project that I had pulled out were uh, pictures I took, um, in uh, starting 
that one, I, I don't remember what year I took it. But anyway, this project was portraits of Californians, the new California, I called it. And uh, I started that project in 1999. Uh, and I worked on it till about 2006. And I had just moved to Berkeley from living in Palo Alto for eight years. And then I moved to Berkeley. And um, the people in Berkeley were not like the people in Palo Alto. And that was a good thing. And um, I, I really enjoyed the variety of people that I was bumping into when I lived here. And um, so I devised this project that if I called it Portraits of Californians, it basically gave me permission to photograph anybody that I saw that I found of interest. And so um, there's, a, there's a whole variety of, of people here. And um, I think that uh, at, at the point when I was doing these pictures, I, I had been in Rome at, at the American Academy in Rome prior to this pr project in 1998. And I did a, a series of portraits in Rome in a studio I had there uh, against a plain black background. And I was trying to photograph Roman people who looked like the people that you'd see in the paintings. And so then I came here and I started doing portraits of Californians and in my studio against the plain black background. and. I think they're somewhat, they're, they're influenced in a way by uh, the headshots that Julia Margaret Cameron did in, in the 19th century. <laughs> and it's just a variety of different kinds of people um, who I met at all kinds of different places, um, openings and parties and, um, in the in the walking around Caesar Chavez Park in the morning and uh, the, this picture and the one right before it this one in the prior picture I like these two together as a pair I feel I mean she's Moroccan and he's Chinese and I love the two of them together it looks like you know they're having a love affair somehow so I mean in terms of pairing images and sequencing those two. I always like to put those two together, even though they've never met and they don't know who each is, you know, they're each with somebody else. <laughs> it's my fantasy. Okay. This is a woman I met in the Cesar Chavez dog park one morning. She was a friend of a friend that I walked with and she, um, <clears throat> she just said to me, you ever take pictures of people that are dying? And I said, well, not generally, but I have done that. Well, then she informed me that she had a melanoma and she was dying. And I said, well, I'll, I'll take your picture. So she came to my studio and she brought this needle and thread and a doll that she was fixing for a grandchild. And um, I just love the symbol symbolic meaning of the needle and thread uh, in relationship to her and her life at that moment. Okay. And this man uh, used to work, he used to write for the Chronicle. It's Zayed Sardar and he um, is a really good design writer. And um, where did I meet Zayed? I met him at an opening of a friend of mine. And I, I had always liked his articles in the paper. And I never met him, I hadn't seen him, but I just thought I really liked the way he looked and we started chatting and I said, well, I want to do your portrait. And so he came over and I did it. And then he did a little story about me. <laughs> so it was great. Well, that's great. I'll look for that. I'll see if I can find it. He's not there anymore, but he used to be. He used to write this for the Sunday paper uh, all the time and it was in the magazine section, but he's kind of doing other things now. But yes, he's around. And this woman um, I met in a store in Berkeley. I went into the store to buy some clothes and she waited on me. And then when she was writing up the bill, she looked up at me like that. And I went, oh my God, <laughs> I, just, I just couldn't believe her, her eyes and her expression. 
And I, <clears throat> so I asked her if I could do her picture and she said, okay. And she came over and we tried to redo that look, which I think I got. Okay. And uh, somebody knew I was doing this series of people in California and they knew this man who's Tibetan and um, he's a musician. And he came over and he wanted a picture for some album he was doing. I gave him the picture. And this woman lives at the corner. She almost, I mean, she lived, she's died actually. She died quite a while ago, but her name was Phoebe. And I used to say hello to her, um, walk by her house all the time. And one morning she was sitting out there dressed up like this and leaning on her cane. And I said, I really wanted to take her portrait. And um, she said, okay. And I ran back to my studio and I grabbed my four by five. And um, this, I, this is a really embarrassing story, but I, when I load my four by five film, I don't, I always go in the dark room and I turn off all the lights and I close my eyes and I load my film. Well, I was in such a hurry and I was so excited to take her picture that I, I went in the dark room and I did what I thought I normally do and I closed my eyes and then I opened up my eyes and I saw that the safe light had been on. And so of course I fogged all the film, but I thought maybe it would be okay. And so <laughs> I went out and I photographed her anyway and I had a couple of pieces of film that I had not, that I had already loaded, but I wanted more. Well, this was one of the few of the pieces of film that I hadn't, you know, that I had already loaded and it wasn't um, fog because of my stupidity. But I, it's, it's probably the best one anyway. I was lucky. It is really a, a dear photograph. Yeah. Yeah, I just love her expression. She was such a sweet woman. It doesn't seem like, um, I don't know if you've ever been drawn to anonymous street photography. It doesn't sound like it. Um, it you know, it sounds like you're having relationships you know, and having conversations with people. Um, no, I, 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 I like people to know that I'm there and I just feel more comfortable, you know, engaging with people. And um, so I like to talk to them and then have a kind of relationship when we're doing the pictures. And this, this man, um, I dearly love, he, he owns my favorite restaurant in Berkeley, Great China. <laughs> and um, we go there every Friday night or we used to go there every Friday night. Now we get takeout every Friday night from them. But um, he's, he's the owner and I, um, I invited him over one day and to do his portrait. And uh, I, I didn't expect it was gonna turn out like this, but it did. I mean, I, I, I just, I love the way his head is floating and I think he looks like a Buddha. <laughs> but it wasn't my intention to make a picture like that. Anyway, that's him, James. And then um, this woman um, is Juana Alicia. She's an artist and she, she's um, very, um, she lives here in Berkeley. She has done, many murals. She's kind of in the, in the mural tradition of Diego Rivera and she's done a lot of community murals with people. And she has, um, she has something, a big thing at the San Francisco airport. Anyway, she's, she's a force of nature, this person. Okay. And I, oh yeah, and then, the, oh, this is Russ Ellis. <coughs> I love Russ. He, um, he used to teach sociology at UC Berkeley and I met him um, at a Bancroft Library event one night uh, that I went to with my husband and he was sitting next to me at the table and we started chatting and he's very interested in art. He makes sculpture and um, and anyway, I, I invited him to Come to my studio and you know I also really I really love this portrait um and now we're, we're friends so that's 
some of the more recent portraits. Um, Wonderful. Maybe that's enough. Is that enough? That's enough. <laughs> that's, that's the perfect amount. Okay, Sandy, thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I noticed there's so many comments in the chat. One of the things that Vince had mentioned is just that um, how each one of these portraits feels like a like a conversation. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, well, Absolutely. you know, I, I, I like that. I mean, it was a conversation. It is a conversation. I mean, it's just, uh, you have to, I mean, for me, I have to have some kind of connection with the people, you know, in order to, to want to do it. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm attracted to all these people. And I think uh, if I wasn't, I wouldn't be able to make the pictures and people like, uh, they like it when you like the way they look, <laughs> you're attracted <laughs> to them. So it's kind of a mutual thing. Well, um, I will jump in and say uh, thank you so much to Judy and Michelle, and um, uh, and thank you for everybody who came out. We could have another wonderful creative evening together, uh, and this um, uh, recording will be up on our YouTube channel uh, in a day or two. So if you get onto YouTube and search for East Bay Photo Collective, you'll find it there, and. Um, yeah, I just can't say thank you enough uh, to Judy and Michelle for really a special evening. This is just not, you know, it's, it's something that, uh, um, you know, you won't find anywhere else, this kind of conversation and, and um, hearing your, your points of view and the interaction between you. And of course, Judy, you know, your work is so amazing and inspirational to be up close to your work like this and being up close to you, you know, if even if we were in an auditorium listening to you speak, it's actually very different from this in some ways feels more more intimate. So it's been a real delightful experience. Well, it turned out to be fun. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. Judy, you've been so can I just say you've been so incredibly generous to share this new work. It really is fantastic. Um, and for us to be the first people or some of the first people to be able to see this. Um, really, it's, thank you so much. It's really, I, I'm really kind of without the right words because it really is incredibly generous of you. So thank you so much. Really My pleasure. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for helping me to do it. <laughs> You did. Oh, you didn't need my help. <laughs> you didn't need my help. But I'm glad to have gotten to know you a little bit through this process. So um, oh, yeah, no, thank you great. for putting us together. And um, thank you to the audience. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you again, you. everybody. And uh, I put the, the link to EPCO's upcoming events uh, is there. And it's just epco.org slash events. So we've got our, um, our artist talk series continues next month. And then we've got our regular monthly events to which you're all welcome. We would love to see you. Uh, and we can carry the inspiration of tonight on with us to the next EPCO events. Thank you again, um, Judy. Thank you again, Michelle, uh, for making this a super special evening. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. We're Bye. Bye.